Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. Hey, what's up, everybody? We're back again with another episode of the Dr. Dad's with my co-host and one of my best buds i mean i just miss you david it's been so long since we got a chance to hang out hugs hugs distant yeah. hugs buddy that's right <laughs> i know right they need to open the borders already we need to travel we need to go have some good times together yeah yeah we're gonna spread our wings it's it's yes. uh it's been too long i think the last time we got a chance to hang out was probably in Baja. Uh, don't say it man i, yeah, I know hear. i know yeah. it I was know. over a year ago <laughs> Um, so we're going to have a, an amazing conversation with the guests that we've been back and forth in conversations with over the last couple of months. And to be honest, like when I read his bio, I was like, man, this guy sounds like my jam. Uh, he's doing IV therapy. He's doing chelation. He's doing uh, functional medicine. He's doing some incredible things. So I'm going to tell you a little about him. His name is Dr. Stephen Petteruti, and he practices in Rhode Island, right? Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. yeah. Rhode Island. I uh, graduated from Tufts University. And he, he basically busted out of a typical family medical practice and moved himself into functional medicine at, at some point along his career, where he's actually teaching people about longevity. He's, he talked about uh, his sort of longevity pyramid, his structure, the way he helps to support people, meeting them where they are and taking them to the next level. He's, he has a state-of-the-art uh, facility. Uh, beautiful, relaxing environment, offering chelation therapy. Uh, he's calls it the drip bar. He's got IV, high dose IV vitamin C. He works with cancer patients. I mean, this guy's got the full package in his uh, facility. And we're going to just blow the lid off some topics in regards to, you know, functional medicine, how to live an optimal life and just be a superhuman. So Dr. Steven, thank you so much for being on the call with us today. It's a delight. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. David, where, where, do we, where do we start? I mean, there's, there's so this guy's got so much history. He's got, so, he's been, he's done so many things. Where, where should we start uh, on the questioning today? You know, I think a good place to start with you, Doc, is, you know, you're on the same wavelength with me and Nick, and I want you to speak a little bit about your story about this capacity for self-healing and what's kind of led you into the type of medicine and kind of pushing these boundaries where you're at right now and really opening up, uh, I think just painting a different picture for people that when it comes to our longevity and our vitality and our overall health, that there are a lot of other things that can be done to assist our bodies in this healing process. So that'd be, a, I'd love to hear just kind of where you're at on all that stuff. Well, the, yeah, thanks for that lead in. You know, I, um, I, when I was in college, I studied English literature and my pre-med advisor said, what are you doing? You need to be studying anatomy. I said, well, why? He said, so you'll be ready for medical school. I said, aren't they going to teach me it when I get there? He said, well, yeah. So I'm not taking the same course twice. So that was one element. The other was I wanted to study humans. I wanted to study the human condition, their mind, their thoughts. And great writers have that. You know, they preceded psychologists. So that was one element. Then I became an osteopathic family doctor because their philosophy of self-healing really drew me in. And I just like them. They were cool people. And coming out of the army where I did my training, I was really excited to be entering the world of medicine. I found it a little disappointing to me that that was a period of time where the corporate entities were starting to siphon off autonomy and control from primary care amongst other specialists. So I used to be able to go in and assist my patients who had surgery and they took that away and I was doing um, deliveries, and they took that away, and I was taking care of newborns, and they took that away, and I saw the walls closing in, and really, it was my patients that led me there, because, you know, I'm seeing these folks at the tail end of decades of deterioration. We don't have a healthcare system in America or in Canada. We have a disease intervention system. It's all built around people breaking down. Nobody gets paid until somebody gets sick. It's a weird incentive. And even in primary care, they loved me when I'm referring them for studies, when I'm referring them for surgery, when I'm sending people out. How often would we pause and really say, okay, let's get back. Why do we get sick? And then ask a big question, you know, why do we age? 
And aging is the number one risk factor for just about every disease known to man. Now I started really becoming intrigued you know, on a cellular level, what can be done. And I was probing around within my insurance-based practice and I started doing things a little bit differently. Okay, a lot of it differently. And it didn't fit. You know, I needed to find another path forward. And I came home one day and my wife said, you got to quit your job. I said, what? I got a kid in college. I've got bills to pay. I was starting my second marriage, paying alimony. She goes, no, you got to quit your job. You got to just go total, no insurance, do what you want to do. And I said, that's nuts. I had 5,000 patients. I'm seeing 40 people a day. Well, can you imagine how truncated those encounters were? And they were five minute blips. I was doing what everybody else was doing, passing out pills as fast as I could write a script. You know, what's the first thing a doctor thinks about when you enter the exam room? How to get him out of here? Because got another patient waiting. <laughs> They're not thinking about, well, oh, I'm going to have this like thoughtful encounter and I'm going to really help them be healthier. I also realized, guys, that not everybody is buying what I'm selling, and that's okay too. You know, not everybody defines their health the same way. Now, if you define it like we do, which is defying aging on a cellular level, living with full vitality, staying lean and fit and active, then you're in my club. If you define it otherwise, it's your prerogative, but you're not coming to my office. And when I stopped taking insurance, people self-selected. So it was a step forward. Needless to say, three months after we quit all the insurances, we were back at full speed. In other words, you know, build it and they'll come. We spoke a moment ago about this movement amongst your listeners. Why are they listening? They want to know. They want to know about how to take care of themselves so that they can capture some of what is going on in the frontiers of health and in aging. So the other thing I noticed, uh, follow my patients. Now I'm 48 years old. It's like 14 years ago. I'm 62 now, as I mentioned. And I was starting to feel some of the consequences of aging. And I didn't like it. And I knew anti-aging was out there, but I thought it was maybe too much smoke and mirrors. And I dove into it and I found substance. And what I've seen occur, and it's still happening, science is moving at warp speed. And anti-aging is moving very fast. And you've had many of those guests on your show, so you know what I'm talking about. They're doing really cool stuff, legitimate, substantive, important. Medicine, on the other hand, is becoming vertically integrated. It's becoming more profit-centric, and it is therefore less innovative. There's a space for both. And you know, my message to my colleagues and to your listeners is it's not us versus them. There is a need for both of these. What we don't care to see, however, is a dismissal of this idea that we actually can change how we age. Uh, I call myself, I am 120, intellectual medicine 120. And the 120 stands for 120 year lifespan. And that's the goal. You have to have a goal. Well, why not that one? There's legitimacy to it. And then people will think, yeah, but I don't wanna spend 20 years in a wheelchair. False thinking. To get there, you gotta be healthy first. So. That's how I, I got into the space that I'm in. And the rest is just, once I liberated myself from the limitations of standard medicine, I had the ability to study more. I had more time that I could devote because this requires, as you guys know, perpetual never ending self-study. There's always something new that I need to learn in order to decide if it can help my, you know, my patients. So those things all came together holding on to the core elements of conventional medicine. Hey, I break my leg, I'm gonna go see the orthopedic guy, right? Um, there's a niche and a role and important space for that. But holy cow, what I've seen happen in this life-changing space has been very validating. And we were talking earlier about how do you persevere amongst hardship? Well, because you believe in what you're doing and you see the results. Wow, you painted such a beautiful picture of your, of your journey into where you are now. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate the fact that it's medical doctors like you that ask those questions or, or have the, their partners kind of nudge them in the direction they need to go. And they know that they need to go. It's just there's there's so much, I think, 
you know, fear in, um, in just the safety of like, what if, what if I can't continue? What if this, you know, like you said, the kid in college and there's still life and, you know, we're, we're doctors. I think uh, there's this impression of people often or patients that could just go, Oh, they've got everything figured out. It's all sorted. You know, they see the the patients they do and they get on through life and that everything's taken care of. But you, I mean, you, sh- it, in your story, you share the depth of, the things that you were struggling with and that you battle with uh, on a daily basis, you know, just getting through the next patient so you can make sure you can see the entire patient load so that insurance can cover, you know, all your bills, you know, yeah. and to step into a reality where you have to, you have to really show up for the person. And, and it's really a testament to you showing up in service. So on that, on that road towards service, yeah. you, you create some amazing intellectual property. I'd love for, for you to explain what you explained to us with regards to this pyramid and sort of meeting people where they are and then how you take them to the next level in this, uh, in this framework that you've created. I'd love to. So anti-aging is real. Let me emphasize that to every listener. You do not have to age as homo sapiens have done so for 100,000 years. That's a bold statement but it's true. It's an enormously exciting time to be alive, folks. You know, I'm, I'm 62, as I mentioned. I've had 12 knee surgeries. I played college football. I should be a wreck. Some would say I am. <laughs> but I play, I play volleyball Friday nights. I do three matches. It's a blast. I'm the oldest guy out there. We're having a ball. This is fun. Like, why are we here? We're here to have fun. We're here to live life abundantly. So let's get after that piece. But, you know, you got to you have to understand that it can be done rather than, and this is the mantra from many in conventional medicine. Hey, you know, if your doctor says to you, well, you know, you are fill in the blank. You are 58 Mm. dot, dot, dot. What can you expect? That's a white flag to me. Right? So in my practice, you never get that pass because whatever's going on, we can address it, but not everybody needs the same thing depends on where you are in the, in the anti-aging pyramid. Are you overweight? Are you 60 or are you 30? Where do you fit? And I would advise listeners to be wary of anti-aging experts who are what I call like a one trick pony. They have one thing and they try to condense all of anti-aging into this amplified value of their one thing. Usually you could ferret that out because there's a proprietary dynamic behind it. Since I do everything, I'm not wedded to anything. You know, so let's talk about that pyramid. Where do you start? You got to put the foundation under you, folks. You got to move, right? Exercise, call it what you like. You can't be idle. You need relationships. You've got to have meaningful existence, meaningful work. Um, You've got to be a non-smoker. If you want to be in my pyramid, right? There's no space for that. You can't abuse drugs and alcohol. It doesn't jive. You could do all that stuff, but it's not the life I'm constructing. The next layer, and this is colossally important, percent body fat. I have a body analyzer in my practice. It's a routine vital sign. What's your percent body fat? Don't tell me your body mass index, right? You could be bound of muscle and you'll look skewed. You've got to look at percentages. For women in general, we're telling them aspire toward a, a body, a percent body fat less than 35%. For men in general, we're saying less than 20, depending on your genetic endowment, will have an effect on that number. So that's an important layer of the pyramid. Then moving on, you've got to look at, we talked earlier, toxic heavy metals. I am a firm believer that it is unrecognized contributor to many chronic diseases, including cancer, heart disease, dementia. I mean, think about it. If the entire population were being poisoned at the same time with the same poison, how would you ever know it? Mm. We'd all be suffering the same consequence. So you look around and you say, well, dementia rate is like 8%. Is it? It's not that way in every country. You know, should it be that high? Is there something underneath it? Heart disease, you know, say, oh, Guy's 72, died of a heart attack. Oh, okay, that happens. Whoa, time out. How come we're taking this in stride? Because it's the way it is. What we have found, because we do provocative heavy metal tests quite commonly, is everybody is loaded with lead. It's not shocking. So they've done archaeological studies. They looked at the bones of prehistoric man, and they found 
that currently we have a lead level in our bone that's a thousand times what is believed to be the baseline. Wow. A thousand times. People say, well, where'd it come from? You got it from your mom in utero to begin with, right? It was in the umbilical cord blood, and then it just accumulates. You can eat organic, but it doesn't stop the kale from sucking up lead tainted rain. So it's hard to dodge. It's also been estimated that modern um, Western living people have a lead level equivalent to that of ancient Rome. And, you know, it's been correlated with issues in, in their society. So we need to then look at that as a component. Um, my, my esteemed colleague, Gervasio Lamas, has done great work with chelation therapy. He's the guy that helped sponsor, that helped lead the study that proved that chelation therapy can reduce heart attacks and strokes. Hmm. Um, the TAC trial was published in 2013. Nobody's ever heard about it. If it were a drug, it'd be on the front page of Time Magazine. But because it's a bag full of vitamins, it got buried. And you know what they do when they don't like a result? They make you do another study. So it's like sending a bill to committee. So right now, Dr. Lamas is leading what's called TACT2, T-A-C-T, Trial to Assess Chelation Therapy. Point is that he demonstrated cause and effect and outcome. In the paper I published, we demonstrated a capacity for chelation therapy administered once every month or two to lower lead levels. That's exciting. Lead is a pure toxin. The critics would say, yeah, but, yeah, but you can't prove it prevents dementia. Well, that study is nearly impossible to do. The analogy I'll use is if they came to your house next door and they put a yellow tape around it and they say, oh, you can't go over there. It's contaminated with lead and cadmium. You wouldn't say, well, I want to study to prove it's going to hurt me. You'd say, get it the hell out of there. This stuff's in the body. And that's what we're identifying because it's not part of mainstream medicine doesn't mean it's irrelevant. So the pyramid, right? Healthy lifestyle, percent body fat, then you got to get the lead out. Why do I put percent body fat beneath lead? Because I believe it's more important. You know, if you're spending your money, and this is another detail, like what's your budget for anti-aging? And where are you going to spend that money? So I've had patients come to me, you know, Nick, they're in their, they're in their 40s. And they're saying to me, uh, I want to go on growth hormone. Say, no. I've heard those stories before. <laughs> yeah. You're 40 years old. Yeah. You don't need growth hormone. Or, you know, and again, David Sinclair is a brilliant anti-aging researcher out of Harvard. He published this great book, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. Recommend it to all your listeners. I read it. It was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. He talks about mitochondria and about the value of NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. That's great. You know, if you're 30, you don't need it. You're busting with it. And it's not cheap. So you want to put stuff in its priority. So regardless of the age percent, body fat is king of the hill. We could certainly spend time discussing the challenges there. I will summarize it thusly. If you have a percent body fat that is relevant, and I'm talking, you want to lose 10 pounds, do your diet and exercise. You need to lose like 10, 15% of your body weight. That's a metabolic condition that diet and exercise will not typically succeed at. And go to somebody who's an expert in weight loss therapy. Um, that, what you just said there is so darn important that I think people just don't understand. Can you can you flesh that out in a little bit more detail? Because oh, that's that's I, huge. Yeah. I'd love to. So I have two bucks, two books in the pipeline. You know, my promotional tour is out of sync. I should have the books ready to go, but one of them <laughs> is about obesity and um it is a metabolic disorder. It is a neurochemical disorder. It is a discriminated against, stigmatized condition that is chronic and relapsing. And we've taken that and we've put it on the shoulders of the patient. So a typical patient will say, well, I went to Weight Watchers. And that really worked well, but my weight came back. And then I did, you know, OptiFast and my weight came back. Folks, you didn't fail. The program failed you. So there's the first bias, right? We're blaming the victim, if you will. Some of these people, and I've heard hundreds, if not thousands of histories, I do medical weight loss treatment in my practice. I prescribe medications for weight loss. It's one of the things that, that kind of uh, got me identified as a problem child in the course of my career. 
because it was out of sync. All right, if you have a remedy for a problem, you don't need to step out of the box to get to the solution. If on the other hand, the problem is not being affected by what's out there, we owe it to the patients to rethink the problem. You know, when I was in the army, we had soldiers, they were working out all the time. They had meals given to them by the army and they were getting thrown out of the army because they were too heavy. Hmm. They used to call it the fat boy program. And my job, I'm sitting there at North Post Clinic, was to squeeze their thyroid, do a TSH. If that was normal, then they're just lazy and they don't know how to put the fork down and you throw them out. Wow. How primitive. And it hasn't moved much in 30 years. There's George Blackburn out of Harvard. I started attending his lecture series because I felt like nobody else was interested in this, but he was. And his curriculum really inspired me to then develop an entire program around that. Here's the thing, folks. If you're struggling with that level of obesity, you need a permanent, durable, open-ended relationship with an expert in the field. You can't do this all by yourself. Very few can. They're the outlier. They're the exception that proves the rule. That's that dude on television who tells you all you have to do is jump rope for 82 hours and you're going to be fine because he did it. All right. That's one dude. There's always some freak that can do anything. Or Jared with Subway. Like that guy. Oh. Just... <laughs> uh, how much did I, did I hate to see the biggest loser? Yeah. Yeah. Just Another one. Another one. Torture these four folks. Yeah. If you can't live there, don't go there. Mm -hmm. And these liquid fasts, I'm totally against. They just shrink muscle. They shrink bone. They damage the, uh, the, the vital organs. Mm -hmm. And they do nothing to impart durable change. So there's a, a balance. We have to accept the genetic structure we're born with. We also need to adapt. I mean, you guys don't eat like other people. I don't. You know, I don't eat like the average American. All right, look, everything's gotten supersized. So we drop these poor folks genetically predisposed towards obesity into the bubbling cauldron called America and our dietary patterns. And we get mad at them for getting fat. Like it's like it's their fault. Mm -hmm. You realize in the history of mankind, in the history of Homo sapiens, there's never been a fatter time on the planet than right now. And the fattest country in the whole world is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me our genes have changed. So you know, we need to promote doctors, naturopaths, chiropractors. We need to promote people that are willing to engage. In my opinion, we should liberalize, liber we should make it easier for uh, non-doctors to prescribe. Look, there's nothing magical about the fact that I'm a doctor that makes me capable of prescribing pharmacology. It is really about command and control. And I think that that is really limiting. So I became board certified in obesity therapy and I realized what a bad thing that is. Here's why that's bad. If I'm board certified, does it mean that if you're not, you ought not to be treating this condition? Think about that, right? It's so ubiquitous. And now we have these surgical programs. Trust me in the future. I mean, think of a surgical procedure you look back at in horror now. Frontal lobotomies. They thought they were doing a good thing. Let's cut this dude's brain out and he'll behave. I maintain surgical treatment for obesity is a frontal lobotomy equivalent. They call the gut the second brain. Mm -hmm. We are taking a knife to a pharmaco-neurochemical psychosocial dilemma that is chronic and relapsing. And I've seen those folks as well. Talk about experiments with unknown outcome. Furthermore, when you have a nation of what do we have 300 plus million in the U S and fully half the nation is obese. You could take every surgeon in America tomorrow and make them a bariatric surgeon and operate 24 hours a day. You wouldn't put a dent in it. So who are we serving? You know, why is it proliferating? We're serving. It's a, it's a very well um, reimbursed endeavor. And now we're taking children and subjecting them to it. So, I'm not totally four square against gastric bypass in all circumstances. However, there's a gap between Weight Watchers, oops, now we're going to operate. What happened to the middle part? It's not there. So that's something, you know, that I hope your patients take to heart, your clients, the people listening to the show. 
you know, you can do this behavioral, nutritional behavioral change is enormously difficult. It's not, a, and you guys know this, you've done the histories. It's not a deficit of knowledge. You can't get a book that says, eat this, don't eat that. My patients, the first time they see me can teach me about calories. They've studied them. It goes deeper. It's primitive brain impulse. That requires ongoing support and reinforcement. Otherwise, you're going to slip right back into it. That's the way our brains are oriented. So succeeding in that space is enormously satisfying. When these patients get listened to and they get a path of ongoing care. You know, I mentioned a moment ago, what's your budget for anti-aging? Not everybody can do everything, right? We all have a swallow capacity. We've got a budget. What supplements are you going to buy? You know, how many are you going to add? Where should you put your effort? Start with the weight. You'll never go wrong. Find somebody that can help you with that and stay with them. I've had patients with me, you know, for 15 years awesome. because I, I'm not good at what I do and they fail. <laughs> what they need. It's like, it's like being a diabetic. You know, yeah. It doesn't go away. Um, so that's a component. In, in my book, I describe three types of fat, uh, three types of obesity, type one, born to be big. You know, we're talking about the, the, the left tackle on the football team, the big kid in junior high, never knew a small day in their life, never will, but you can be a healthy big person. Type two, adult onset, more common. It gradually accumulates somewhere in the 20s and goes upward. And then type three is fascinating. These are the, the menopausal or if you're a man, andropausal, mid-abdominal weight gain, I don't know what's wrong. I'm the same, eat the same, I'm exercising, and all of a sudden I've got this big tire over my midsection, right? And you can actually have all three types. So this is where things start to merge, where you get that patient who's got obesity, and oh, by the way, there's maybe it's a 48-year-old woman who's starting to feel tired and losing her libido, or maybe it's a 52-year-old man who's losing his energy and confidence, when people think about hormones as being strictly sexual mm-hmm. activity it goes way beyond that, right? Cognitive function. So kind of all comes together. And I guess that's how I ended up where I am, Nick. It's just the more you piece it together, the pyramid gets bigger. And the more I want to help these folks drive to the next level. Did you know there's a correlation between obesity and dementia? They did a yeah. study looking at, and you did, of course, you look at cat scans. The brain shrinks. Mm-hmm. That's not good. You know, I don't want my brain to shrink. So controlling the obesity, the micronutrient replenishment that happens uh, to help people with their cognitive function can also help them with their weight loss. There is no single supplement nor a single drug that will take a person and control their weight. That will never happen. Mm -hmm. The brain defends its weight. It thinks of weight loss as a prelude to death. However, There are combinations that work beautifully and those can be different for every person and you need to have somebody guide you through it. You know, the notion that, well, um, you know, supplements is not going to work for you. The, um, the alpha lipoic acid will be ineffective. Well, yeah, if that's all you're doing, when you put it together with nutritional behavioral change and other supplements, green tea extract is a nice product I use often in my weight loss pathway I mentioned alpha lipoic acid. These are the nutraceuticals that can have value when clustered. Paired together. So we talked about three, I think three levels of the pyramid yep. is, uh, so we talked about like the lifestyle, then the, the body composition essentially, and then the detoxification. What's, what's next on that, on that pyramid? Hormones. You know, you, you got two choices, folks. You're either going to get on your hormones or you're going to suffer negative consequence, mm-hmm. period, end of story. Look, we were born to have these hormones in us. Natural selection uh, sort of guided us towards our reproductive capacity. But there is no natural selective pressure to make you go from 60 to 90, right? That's on you. You've already, what? You you were born, you grew to maturity, you reproduce, you raise your child to adulthood. What happens next? You die, right? Right? So That's amazing. That's that's, (laughs) right? So the body is preparing to die. That's what aging is, right? All right. I practice anti-aging medicine, not immortality medicine. I'm rooting for that. I don't know how that's going to turn out. 
But no, the hormones have to be there. And this is a big point of departure between me and those of us that are practicing hormonally supported anti-aging. And here's an important distinction. Hormone therapy is critical to anti-aging, but it is not the whole thing. Yeah. So don't confuse this. Don't commingle them. You got to have the hormones for women in my practice by age 50. If you come to me at age 50 and you're a female and you say, I feel great. I really don't think I need hormones. Stop. By the time you start to feel it, you've probably lost 20% of your bone mass. Let's get in front of it. Get down to that cellular level. You know what's coming next. You don't build the arc when it's raining out. You start now. Same thing for men. Now, men sometimes can get by a little bit longer. They can make it up to age 60. By the time they're 60, I'm proactively encouraging them to pursue it. Now, more frequently, it happens way before that. I want to talk about women in particular. I use a lot of testosterone in my practice for women, a lot. It's my first hormone that I go to, especially younger women in their 30s and 40s. Here's a common scenario, I see this all the time. 44 year old woman's you know, had kids or high school, is getting tired, it's gained a few pounds, not sleeping at night, still menstruating regularly, getting irritable and short tempered, losing libido. She's not interested, they're, they're get up and go, got up and left. And they go to the doc and the doc says, don't forget the doc's got three minutes to get you the hell out of the room, right? Um, maybe the person's even a little bit emotional. Doc says, well, you must be depressed. You're not sleeping. You're gaining weight. You've lost interest in life. These are signs of depression. This is what I used to do in my former life, prescribed Prozac. We thought it was awesome. This drug was great. It's safe. They seem happy. Little did we know how hard it is to come off. And it's a massive weight gaining drug. And it obliterates libido and sexual responsiveness. So this poor woman came in with this list of complaints and you gave her a drug that's made her fat and anorgasmic. You think you did her a favor. No, you take the same case and now <clears throat> recognize that testosterone, fading levels of testosterone can correspond to all those symptoms. Sleep disruption, vaginal dryness, libido, loss of libido. Now I'm so well known for what I do in my area that patients come to me fully well knowing this is going to be part of the agenda because they've talked to friends, they've looked at some of my book, my uh, podcast so that it becomes part of the agenda. But think how often in my former life, never would a doctor say, and by the way, how's your sexual functioning? How's your physical relationship with your partner? It's critical to maintain that as an element of youthfulness. It is, it is a vital sign. So you take that same woman, don't put her on Prozac. She needs testosterone in most cases. I don't care what the blood level says. That's another, that's another fallacy. Well, my blood says I'm not in menopause. Really? Do you need to do a blood level on a 14-year-old to tell if he's in puberty? Hell no. The age tells you that. So it's the same thing. You're 48 years old. You're in menopause. Call it what you want. You're in that window, right? So get blood levels. It's important to establish baselines, but it doesn't dictate therapeutic decision. There are some labs that will list the average, or I should say the range of testosterone for women starting at zero. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you can't be abnormal if the lab is reporting that parameter. So I test testosterone level and I specifically focus on free testosterone, biologically active component. Then we will implement therapy and it is not fire and forget. You know, you've got to go non-oral, so you can't take it by mouth, either pellets or injectable. And then within a month, it's like watering a flower. Most times the women come back, their, their brain is better. So you know the brain fog moment, word finding, I'll say, do you sometimes have difficulty finding a word and looking for it? Yeah, I've noticed that. Or confidence. These are real intangible, real qualities. Testosterone is a neurotransmitter it accelerates the speed of electrical impulse from one neuron to the next. And speed equals memory equals learning. So for the women, we start with testosterone. Oftentimes, they will make enough estrogen out of that testosterone to give them all the estrogenic need. So, and it's not that I'm afraid of estrogen. You know, the studies are in, we know estrogen does not contribute to breast cancer. The Women's Health Initiative proved it in the 1990s. 
and every meaningful study since has validated that outcome. It was medroxyprogesterone, mm -hmm. the artificial progesterone, that was the only hormone that really correlated with a slight uptick in risk. So now we have to put it in context. Now we're talking real philosophy, right? Anti-aging, you don't have to do hormones. You can age like your grandmother did, it's your prerogative, but you gotta be comfortable because something bad this way comes to us all. And when that comes, will you have the philosophy of regret consequence? So I told you, I've been on testosterone for 14 years. If I were to get prostate cancer, I must be comfortable with what I did. Now I know I am because I do, I've buried myself into the research and uh, the weight of evidence does not support mm -hmm. testosterone therapy increasing prostate cancer risk. It doesn't mean that I'm immune and I could still get it. And if I do, I would have no regret. Now, if you're the person who puts yourself in that scenario and thinks, oh my God, what I do to myself, I never should have done that. Don't do the anti-aging hormone. There's no guarantee. The flip side of that, of course, is uh, well, take the woman who chooses not to do hormones. You're guaranteed you're going to shrink. You're going to lose height. Bones are going to wither. Why? Because they don't have hormones. Uh, genitalia are going to shrink. Um, the vaginal mucosa is going to wither. The brain's going to slow down. The skin's going to lose elasticity. These are not maybes. These are inevitable. And you could do all that and then get breast cancer. Mm -hmm. You may be thinking, son of a gun. We have women in our practice who have had breast cancer who come to us seeking hormone therapy. And they're aware that it's not standard of care. And they're aware that conventionally doctors would not recommend it. And after really thoughtful and deep consultative reflection, because although there's not a correlation, I shouldn't say, I should say the weight of evidence doesn't support estrogen and testosterone contributing to breast cancer risk. There is such a thing as estrogen sensitive breast cancer, whereby the hormone may amplify the potential of relapse. So women have to go into that knowing that we can't have all the answers. But they have said to me on several occasions, I don't want to live this way. You know, mm -hmm. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll take that risk. I can't sleep. I'm having hot flashes. So there's one woman I'm thinking of um, shared with me the fact that she's in these uh, groups, talk groups, chat groups for women with breast cancer. She said, you know, doctor, half the women throw away their anti-hormone therapy every month. I said, why? She goes, because they don't want their doctor to know they're not taking it. Yeah, Think about how much is wrong in that statement. The doctor is going to disapprove of your decision on how you want to manage your body and your life. Even if it upticks the risk of breast cancer, I maintain that people have a right to make informed choices about how they want to live. Um, and consequently, we do endeavor to, to pursue and help women in that space as long as it's you know balanced and they understand the risk. Now, we don't just sit there and do nothing about risk, right? You do IV therapies in your practice, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, how fabulous is that? How underutilized? What a powerful tool this is. Do I have time to regale about IV because this does jump in? Oh, so, um, so as your listeners can easily find out just by Googling me, um, I've had encounters with my Department of Health, who I respect and I've actually grown to like. And there have been times where they didn't quite endorse what I was saying or doing, and I had consequences to my license. And some of those consequences were self uh, wounds that I self inflicted, and others really were philosophical, and they were advocating for my philosophy. So one I'll share with you has to do with high dose vitamin C for cancer. Now, of all the IV therapies that help cancer, none has been more studied than vitamin C. It's been shown in numerous studies on a cellular level to be toxic toward cancer. So it has the possibility of killing cancer cells. Now in humans, it's really, really hard to study. It's, it's a cheap generic bag of vitamins. So there's not money behind it, but there are a number of studies. There's phase one studies proving safety. 
There are clinical cohorts showing uh, improved quality of life, and in many cases, extended length of life. But here's what I think is the real place I want to go with vitamin C and cancer. Secondary prevention. So take that woman who's had breast cancer, had a lumpectomy, doesn't want to go on hormone therapy, or maybe does, either way. They say, well, you know, you've got a 99% chance of not having a relapse. Now, cancer statistics can be misleading. They must have a, a parameter to create these numbers. And the parameter is five years. So stage one breast cancer, lumpectomy, five years later, you know, 98, 99% survival. It's pretty good. But wait, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study about two, three years ago showing delayed relapse from breast cancer. And you take that stage one cancer and you go out 10, maybe 15 years, and the relapse rates go over 10%. Mm. That is enormously high for something that we believe that we cured with a knife. Whenever I see somebody say, I'm cancer free, it gives me chills. It's a cellular disease, folks. There's mm -hmm. something known as a doubling time for one cancer cell to become two. It can take 60 days. It can take, at that pace, seven, 10 years for a cellular cancer to grow to the size of one centimeter. And that's what we call early detection. It really isn't. That's 30 doubling times. You go to 40 and you're dead. So my point isn't that it's not worth catching early, but rather let's get to the cellular level. So here's my theory, and this is what got me in trouble. I was on a radio show talking about the power of high dose vitamin C, and I think we're not using it in the right patients. We should be using it ironically in patients with no tumors who've had cancer in the past, in whom there are stem cells or circulating tumor cells that I believe act like a slow virus. They linger, the immune system gets knocked down, and all of a sudden they start reproducing. Because that's what keeps us all alive, folks, right? It's our immune system. It's killing the cancer cells as they're being made. Now, think about this theoretically. I'm sitting here, maybe I had a prostate cancer removed, maybe I had thyroid, fill in the blank. Every month, I advocate for these patients to get high-dose vitamin C every month for the rest of their lives, open-ended. Mm -hmm. We do 50,000 milligram infusions commonly here. We find it very well tolerated, very affordable. Now, the theory is you've got a thousand cancer cells in your body. You don't know where they are. What I love about vitamin C, it goes everywhere. It's mm -hmm. a total body infusion. And we know it's toxic, toxicity toward cancer cells exists. And we know it's totally safe for, the, for your native cells. So you, you don't have to worry. What are you risking? Time and money. Now, those are relevant commodities and I would never be dismissive of the value there of them. However, for my patients who've had cancer, I'm endorsing this approach. And if you can't do it every month, do it every other month. So I, well, on my radio show, I'm talking about this, and I, and I mentioned the word probability in the context of the theory. And I got reprimanded for using the word probability because it had an implication of greater than 50% chance. Hmm. And um, it, it really cautioned me about how sensitive, and I, I, I see where they're coming from, right? Um, our conventional colleagues are wary of patients being misled. Mm -hmm. All I need are apricot seeds and the stage four cancer is going to disappear. Right? One of the reasons why I advocate local infusion centers, I think that everybody in the Western hemisphere should be within 30 minutes of an infusion center, a drip bar, if you will, because these are chronic conditions. You can fly to Mexico you can do vitamin C every day for four weeks. You're going to drop 30,000 or more, and you still got to come home. Mm -hmm. and the disease is not going away. So I like the chronic therapy. That patient who chose not to go on hormones, we're going to get her percent body fat down because that drives cancer. If you're a non-smoker and you're overweight, that is now your number one carcinogen. Mm -hmm. So get that under control. So those are the ways where I see infusion-based care having great value for people who are otherwise fully intact. As I mentioned, I do it every month. 
because we know what do men die of? Heart disease. What do women die of? Heart disease. What's the thing most cancer patients die of? Heart disease. What does chelation do? It can reverse calcium scores. I told you we have that paper I'll be publishing soon. I was working on it this past weekend. 14 patients with CAT scan evidence of calcium buildup on their coronary arteries. All 14 of them had reversal reduction of their calcium buildup. That's never happened before. It's never been documented in such a consistent manner. And oh, by the way, only one of them was taking a statin drug, not because I discourage it, but because they don't want to take it. You know, this is a, these are the people we serve. You know, they were a little bit wary of pharmacology at times. David, jump in, buddy. I know you got some questions for him. Well, no, I, you know, as I'm listening to, to Doc speak, I'm thinking, you know, you've made, you've had very different beginnings. I mean, you, you've gone from like this, just handing pills all day, right, to now we're in this functional capacity. I mean, it's just awesome to hear your journey, like we were talking earlier. But I'm loving how, how, how free you are with moving outside the box and really pushing the limits of medicine here. Because this is something that I think everybody just needs to hear more of. I mean, it's not being said enough, especially by a medical doctor. And I, I love that you're in this space of saying, look, people wake, like, I don't, I'm not going to cuss, but wake the F up and understand that your health goes beyond just popping a pill for symptoms and that we have to take this much deeper approach and you have to take care of yourself. You have to have skin in the game. You have to do your work as well. And yes, as practitioners, we can help these people and guide them where they need to go. But at the end of the day, like you can't, you know, you were saying it earlier, uh, a woman can't come into you with her hormones all screwed up and just say, well, just fix my hormones without doing everything else. Like it doesn't work that way. No, you know, and I think if more people um, understood this, uh, this type of approach to health and this paradigm, like you're saying, we wouldn't be having these big problems like we're having. And mm -hmm. it's just like we're stuck in this stigma in our country. Uh, like you're saying, whether it's, you know, conventional medicine's all bound by money and, and pills and, and it's just a different type of thing, but it's for acute care. And where we're struggling is, is chronic health problems. And, and then that need is not being met by enough doctors that are bringing people enough of the right information for it to get to a point where people are waking up, I think, because you still find people that I feel like are in the dark and they still don't get it. And they, they still think that there's this quick fix for the problem that they have. And there's a shortcut, you know, for, for the issues that they're having. They're, they're and, a pill for that. They got a pill for that. Yeah. Right. And, and it's funny because I'm listening to you earlier talk about like the gastric bypass, you know, El Paso, we have a massive obesity problem here. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, we have, you know, we have metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes and obesity. That's like the big ones, heart disease here. It's a dialysis center, like every other block here. And there's billboards all along I-10 here for gastric bypass by the hospitals here. And it disgusts me every time I drive down I-10 and I see these things because I don't know anybody, because I know a lot of people that have had gastric bypass. I don't know one person that's had that procedure that doesn't have complications and has had to have multiple surgeries and issues. And it's like, we can just keep driving this quick fix type idea for people. And so, you know, helping them understand what these solutions need to look like. And I just feel like more doctors need to wake the, and I'm going to cuss, more doctors just need to wake the fuck up, man. Because it's, 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 it's going to take doctors waking up to educate the general public. I don't think this is going to happen by any means of anybody else trying to do it. It's going to take people like us having to, to bring forth the right message. And I, I think there are people like us that are the historical outliers, right? I'm an osteopathic family doctor. In the hierarchy of conventional medicine, there's hardly a lower form of creature, right? <laughs> we are, I tried to love cardiology, they made more in a week than I did in a year. <clears throat> you know, and I do the rotation and everybody in the waiting room, guess what? They've got heart disease. How boring is that? You don't have to think, you just do. Now I'm not um, disparaging my cardiology colleagues, but I agree with you, Dave, but here's the other part of that equation. This revolution in health will not come from the top down. There's not a king that ever got up and looked at the kingdom and said, wow, I really need to change things. This isn't going, no, hospitals, tomorrow they need to meet their bottom line. They make money with full beds. 
they make money intervening in chronic illness. It is incongruous for us to expect them to suddenly act against their own physical best interest. They're not malicious. It's not a cabal. They're simply, uh, I call it a myopic self-interest, right? I see a fat person. I do surgery. By the way, I get paid really well for that. I, and I've seen it help people. It's a myopic self-interest. You and I, you know, Nick, we're, we're talking about um, an enlightened self-interest. And it mirrors what's happening with the patients. What's going to change it is the internet. And it's already changing it. You show me an intelligent patient with a little bit of curiosity and, and with a diagnosis, and I'll show you an expert in a month. They'll know more about their disease than most doctors. It's true. And what is, right? And what do some doctors say to the patient? Oh, don't go on the internet. It'll confuse your little brain. Mm-hmm. So paternal. That's one of their fear factors about folks like us. We're out here, I are doing a podcast and we're talking about crazy ideas. You know what? The average listener is just too stupid to separate fact from fiction. We need to edit what's being said, right? That's nonsense. I love this analogy. I think I can wrap it up in a minute. So here you have the Catholic Church. I'm a born Catholic, love the Catholic Church. However, there was a time where they weren't so cool and they had the book, right? Nobody else had the book. They couldn't even freaking read. Uh, here It says, you got to pay me indulgences. Yeah, that's right. Step right up. All of a sudden, the Gutenberg press happened. Martin Luther said, hey, wait a minute. Here, people, read the book. And they go, oh, crap. I don't see it. Oh, this is medicine. This is the era that we're in. In my early career, I had the book. The patients couldn't get the book. If I wanted to do research, I would go to the medical library. I'd go to the stacks, get out the copy machine. You know, in three hours, maybe I'd copy four articles. You couldn't even get in the library because it wouldn't let you there. So we had a monopoly on information. The internet has blown that up. Anybody can go to PubMed and can put in some search words and pop up 100 articles on a disease or condition of their choice. And I tell my patients, go do that. Go to PubMed and Google chelation therapy and heart disease. Go to PubMed and Google vitamin C and cancer. You'll find an array of information supporting and against. By golly, I trust your intelligence. And more important, perhaps than even that, your philosophy. And that's what's happening. It is the medical reformation and the mainstream doesn't care for it because they lose power. Everybody's reading the book and you're listening to these guys on their podcast and they're talking about IV therapy and right. Chelation therapy. Really? How can a cardiologist in the country not support a patient doing that? Particularly one who's a diabetic. The result of that trial had a 43% reduction in medical complications, heart attack, stroke, catheterizations, 43% 43% in diabetics. Wow. It's, it's almost unethical that we haven't rushed it to market. So that's why I'm grateful to be on your show in part, because people have heard words maybe that are new to them, or maybe they've heard before, and it'll start to reinforce value. Um, I have taken the opinion that we need to go direct to the people. We can't wait for medicine to catch up because they never will. Think of it in two separate spheres, right? You've got disease intervention. That's medicine as we know it. Then you've got health. And that's our responsibility. It's like you're saying, Dave, it's the owner of the body. It is our prerogative to decide how we're going to maintain our health. And there's a new thing out there. And that's what I'm advocating for, the anti-aging thing, right? Hey, when I was a kid, my budget for watching television was zero, I had a TV with rabbit ears, three stations, cost me nothing. Right? Now, three, 400 bucks a month, I can't even turn the thing on, but it's, it's my point is it's a new thing, right? That's what health is today. It's a new thing. And it's no longer as simplistic as, you know, get rid of these three foods and everything will be fine. No, you got to do the pyramid. You know, you got to know where you are on that. You need to find somebody that can help guide you along the pyramid. It can't be your, your conventional reinsurance reimbursed doctor. As great as they are in their sphere, 
they're almost not allowed to talk about this stuff. You know, if I'm an insurance reimbursed doctor and I'm talking about vitamin C for cancer, I have somebody who will reprimand me for that. My boss isn't going to like me spending that time. It's not standard of care therapy. So I'll, my patients will ask me, what do you think about, you know, the chemotherapy? I say, I don't know. I'm not an oncologist. I don't study chemotherapy. I'm knowledgeable about it. What I seek is for my oncological colleagues to have a similar temperament. When a patient asks, what do you think about mistletoe therapy or right up in Canada, I do mistletoe or vitamin, you guys here in Vancouver, I had a patient of mine fly to Vancouver to get mistletoe because for a while it was like illegal in the United States. What do you think about this stuff? All I want my oncologist to say is, look, I'm, it's not my field of expertise, but I want you to go talk to Nick, you know, go talk to Dave because these are guys I trust who know about it. That's a kind of rapport building that I hope occurs, you know, as we move forward so that the patients can have the full breadth of option. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's and, truly a pa patient centered approach. And that's, that's essentially what the patient wants, you know, the, and I love that you, you know, you said this, you know, transformation in, in, in where the, the power is, and it really is now in the, in the hands of the individual, should the individual have that interest and curiosity to, to have maybe hope first, and then realize that there's, there's an answer to some of their uh, problems and at least a, a way to look or a place to look and then and then the doctors to ask um, as we're as we're closing getting close uh, there's so many more questions I got for you we're just going <laughs> to get you back on um, I want to make sure we finish the pyramid sure. did we get to the top is the top of we're not there the yet we're not oh, there yet we got to finish the pyramid man we got to finish All right, it so so then right I'm 62 my hormones are pristine I'm on my, uh, my infusions for chelation. I'm doing my NAD, nicotinamide, anti-nucleotide. Um, I probably started that when I was around 50, presume I already hit all the other buttons. Maybe as young as 40 if I got money to burn, but certainly by 50. Now we're starting to look at stuff like, now comes your growth hormone. When you get to 62, 63, the pituitary gland starts to really suffer and struggle to produce enough growth hormone in grownups like us, it's restorative in nature because it rebuilds things. The thymus gland starts to involute in the absence of growth hormone. The thymus makes T cells part of your immune system. It's not a coincidence that as we get older, we're prone to die from pneumonia and get cancer to our immune system fading. I believe that, well, the studies have supported that, um, growth hormone therapy can have a niche to fill here. Now in our practice, I rarely do growth hormone. There's been a real explosive growth in peptide therapy. These are compounded amino acids, proteins that have an ability to stimulate your pituitary gland to make more of its own growth hormone. Once again, the lab can help, but age, symptom, and philosophy drive that train. Now you can get into the really like cutting edge stuff like rapamycin and rapamune. These are uh, repurposed drugs designed to help alter some of the cellular aging dynamics that take place. What about using metformin, a prescription drug to help with autophagy or flushing out bad cells? Pretty cool stuff. But the top of the pyramid, Nick, it remains flat. It remains unfinished. Yes. I love it. Part. We want to be in a place where when the next great breakthrough happens, we're healthy enough to grab it. And that's going to be telomerase when we can make cells immortal. And telomerase is the enzyme that restores the telomeres at the back end of cells, back end of DNA. And if we can come up with that, and we will, you're going to see human lifespan catapult into the 150 to 200 range. If you built your pyramid, if you didn't, you know, you're going to be the guy who goes, son of a gun. I missed the bus. Right? Like, like there it goes. And all those people getting to be young and look at me, I'm here withering. That's not, that's not where I want to be. Right. Nobody wants to leave the party at 10 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I sometimes leave parties at 10 o'clock, to be honest. I, I, I love my beauty sleep. But uh, not not the longevity party, that's for sure. I'm I'm yeah. in there with you, man. I I want to I want to be there and see uh, my great 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 grandkids if possible. Uh, I love that you left the pyramid unfinished. I mean, 
talk about a framework for innovation of just, you know, the, it just speaks to your personality of just continuously what else is possible, what else is possible. And, you know, that I love getting patients to ask that question instead of like, this is the defined box that I live in. And this is my diagnosis this is who I am. This is sort of the extent to this. That's where I can feel the edges of the box. And that's as far as I go. But, you know, talking about an unfinished framework of, of possibility, that's, that was beautiful. I haven't heard anyone not complete the framework. And I think that that's the thing that you want to do. You want to leave that unfinished so people can, can ask those questions of what else is possible. Uh, Dr. Pedruti, I mean, you shared such beautiful philosophy today and, and um, I, we didn't want to interrupt you because you just shared such, such important stuff. Uh, and, and the pyramid really, really creates that structure for people to understand just the prioritization and, you know, meet, meet you where you are. You don't have to get into the hormones right off the bat. You really got to start where you are and, and then we'll, we'll get you there with, with building the relationship as you spoke to in being a doctor. Um, is there, as we come to a close, is there anything else that you feel like you'd like to leave with the, the listeners and, and you please let them know where they can find you and connect with you. And um, you've got a book coming out in a, in a number of months. Um, but yeah, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I encourage your listeners to continue to tune into your show to keep updated. I encourage them to go to Intellectual Medicine. Um, intellectual Medicine, Dr. Pederuti is where they can find my uh, website, um, my podcasts. And in the near future, it's where they'll be finding the promotion for the book, um, you know, the Anti-Aging Pyramid book that will be coming out shortly. And then um, after that will come the Obesity book because it's another topic of passion for me. And also, probably by about a year out, I'm going to dedicate a book specifically to testosterone therapy for women. I think there's a lot of work to be done to educate the public at large, to motivate them to seek their own path. You know, conventional doctors sometimes will yell at my patients or try to beat them back into submission by disapproving of choices that they make. So you'll need to have some stiffening of your spine in some cases, particularly if you want to go on an alternative path. If you want to go on bioidentical hormones, be prepared for your OBGYN doctor in some cases to oppose it. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay for them to have a contravailing opinion as long as it's tempered and it gives space for you to make your choice. So I guess that's where I'd leave it, you know, letting the listeners continue the research and continue the um, following their own philosophy and making the pyramid fit them. It's awesome. David, anything? Ah, thank you so much for your wisdom and buddy. Love the story and your journey and just keep doing what you're doing, man. I'm going to stay up on you and, and keep following you, man. I'm excited to see what you come with just in the next couple of years and check out your books as well. Thanks guys. Appreciate yeah, thank it very much. You, you guys so added too. We'll look forward to talking about yeah, definitely. And and uh, when your when your book's getting ready to be launched, let's let's uh, do a, uh, another show and, and get more of your information out. And I'll be picking your brain uh, offline as well. <laughs> All the best, Doc. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the Doctor Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.